American Conservation. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. I know everyone's probably just getting signed in, getting set up so you can both see the webinar and hear us as we speak. So I'll give everyone just a few seconds to do so. Want to share a little bit about the agenda today. First, I want to welcome you and I'll talk a little bit about the Salazar Center as well as this webinar series. Then we have a little bit of housekeeping. Then we will hear from our lovely panelists and hopefully have a little bit of time for a moderated discussion before we wrap up. So first of all, I want to just welcome you to the uh, Salazar Center's Connecting for Conservation webinar series. The Salazar Center at Colorado State University supports and advances the health and connectivity of natural systems and landscapes of North America. We know that healthy natural systems support climate adaptation and resilience, protect biodiversity, and supports long-term human health. And our intersectional approach builds bridges that connect academic research, community practice, and policy development. And you can learn more about us on our website at salazarcenter.colostate. Edu. This is the second webinar in our Connecting for Conservation series and is actually the second uh, webinar in a, a focus on indigenous leadership on conservation and climate change. If you missed that first webinar a few weeks ago, you can find it on our website and we will post this webinar as well and you'll be able to watch all recordings of our webinar series through our website, again, salazarcenter.colostate.edu. And we're excited to continue to explore relevant topics in conservation from climate adaptation and resilience to urban forestry, health, equity, and biodiversity, and cross-border work in future webinars. So stay tuned and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the hour today. Now a little bit of housekeeping. All of the attendees are on mute. So if you're dialing in today, we can't hear you, um, but we would love to hear from you. So please submit your questions and comments through the GoToWebinar control panel there on the right. Hopefully we'll get to as many questions as we can and you can submit those starting now. You don't have to wait to the moderated uh, question and answer part of the, the webinar. As I mentioned, the session is being recorded and we will share it out within the next few days. So if you would like to share this with your colleagues, we will be sending it out a link and it will live forever on our website and you'll be able to view it um, as often as you would like. Uh, as I mentioned, you can learn more about us at our website, salazarcenter.colostate.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter at Salazar and America, so Salazar North America. We would love to uh, interact with you there as well. With that, I want to jump in and introduce our first panelist. Dr. Dominique David Chavez has dual appointments as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Native Nations Institute and Colorado State University Department of Forest and Rangeland Stewardship. Dominique is passionate about opportunities to directly support indigenous governance and data sovereignty in environmental research and decision making. Her work focuses on how indigenous Caribbean communities who are especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are responding and adapting to a changing environment. And Dominique is a member of the Arawak Taito community. With that, Dr. Dominique David Chavez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mabrika. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Dominique Aita Inaru David Chavez Diri, Borikin Arawak, Hibaro Taino Daka, Hahongwai Teao. So I'm welcoming you in one of our native Caribbean languages. And I'll be sharing from the perspective of a community member, a multicultural Caribbean community member, as an educator and also as a scientist. And I'd like to thank the organizers for bringing us together. I'm excited to be on a panel with two other Native scholars whose work I really admire and respect. And I'm working from the traditional homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples here in Fort Collins, Northern Colorado. And so to open this discussion, I'll be sharing some definitions to help us find a shared language and also some historical context regarding decolonizing conservation. And I'm just recognizing that many of you listening in are coming from diverse cultural and disciplinary backgrounds. I found this helpful. 
And then I'll just briefly share from my work on Indigenous research governance and climate research and a couple studies that I worked on, including one that's depicted here that's a community-based study we held with rural and Indigenous Caribbean community members. So next slide, please. And Indigenous, when we consider Indigenous, you may come across different definitions. However, in the context of what I'll share, I'll just invite you to understand it through these characteristics. So I'm thinking first of people of the land holding intergenerational or familial ties to a community whose life ways including languages, natural resources, and relationships, sciences, cultural practices, and such, both sustain and are sustained by their relationship to a particular place or region on the earth. And recognizing this history of discrimination often faced in these communities, including past and ongoing displacement, forced colonial education systems that exclude and erase indigenous histories, and genocide and slavery, for example, in our Afro-Indigenous Caribbean communities were very few generations removed from that history. And also recognizing that indigenous community membership is determined through inherent rights to self-determination and community acceptance. And that you may come across many other terms, including common and political language terms, but preference may be given to the name of a tribal nation. And in some cases, there's a external government assigned name and also original indigenous language names that might differ. And lastly, just acknowledging that due to varying histories and political contexts around the world, these definitions remain both complex and political, which is why many international forums, such as the United Nations, recognize the importance of upholding indigenous self-determination and sovereignty when we're determining these working definitions. Next slide, please. And when we consider decolonizing, I'd invite you to think about how we're engaging the underlying historical context in the work that we do, how this has formed the assumptions, motivations, and values that are informing education, research, and practice in our field. And my intention and the work that I share is really focused towards healing and regenerating indigenous lifeways, which has the potential to inform all lifeways that are sharing the land and resources within it. So I've just included um, one reference in case folks want to learn more about that from Linda Smith. Next slide, please. So in the context of environmental conservation, this means pushing back on some of these foundational concepts in terms that were often taught, such as wilderness. And here, Grandfather Google is describing wilderness as this uncultivated, uninhabited region. Next slide, please. However, and looking at this map of indigenous territories, and this is from the Native Land app, we have to wonder where are these uh, uninhabited territories? Where are they hiding? And this is a free map source that can be a really helpful teaching resource also for those who are wanting to understand whose territories they're living and working on and how vast and diverse these territories are. For example, in the US alone, as of this year, we have 574 federally recognized tribes, numerous state recognized tribes and other indigenous communities that lack federal but may have international or municipal recognition such as US territories, including my own Arawak Taino community. And so you might be observing too, and looking at this map, some of these overlapping boundaries, both across tribal communities and across contemporary political borders that are often dissected by colonial languages and where customary land stewardship may be conflicting with national policy. Next slide, please. Yeah, what many of us working in conservation and natural resource sciences experience is this small handful of perspectives and narratives that have been dominating the field for a long time. And these largely ignore those hundreds of diverse indigenous nations and communities, their histories, the concepts embedded within indigenous languages, and the dynamic indigenous knowledge systems that are based on centuries and millennia of years of observation of Earth's natural processes. So not only does this mean we're working with an incomplete data set as scientists, for example, but when conservation narratives are consistently glorifying and attributing a handful of mostly European American men as the discoverers of every canyon, mountain range, and valley, or as the first to classify or develop a taxonomy of species or cloud formations. For example, when folks, and this was taught to me in my education, when folks describe John Wesley Powell as the first person to explore the Grand Canyon, 
They're erasing the lived experiences and histories of numerous tribes who've long interacted with these places, such as the Havasupai in that case, and promoting colonial mythologies. And these, I really see these as inhibiting innovation and problem solving in all of our communities as we're facing uh, social and environmental challenges. Next slide, please. But what's exciting is we're starting to see a shift now, for example, in climate research, which is my primary field of practice, high-level forums, such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, quoted here, and working groups, um, are now formally recognizing the critical importance of including local and indigenous people and their knowledge systems in the work that we do. But given that colonial historical context that I laid out and the residual legacies that I was speaking to, uh, in my own work, I really felt the need to ask how researchers go about engaging those communities. And so I have referenced a paper here that will be shared out in the follow-up email. And it's a, a free open source paper about a case study, a global assessment of climate research studies that include indigenous knowledges. So uh, next slide, and I'll just share a couple of findings from that. So in this study, we look critically into who holds authority and governance in various stages of research, all the way from initiation and design through how it's implemented, the analysis and sharing out of data findings. And so this scale is just one way to assess that based on uh, community levels of participation and who holds authority, the community knowledge keepers or external researchers in that process. And it ranges from contractual on the left up through collegial and indigenous research, which I think some of the other panelists will speak to in more detail, but it's really only at this right end of the scale where indigenous research governance lies, which entails the rights to define, collect, protect, interpret, manage, and apply data in a way that respects indigenous ethics, values, and relational responsibilities. So this is some of the work that we do at Native Nations Institute on Indigenous Data Sovereignty, for example, if you want to learn more about that. And it's really focused towards restoring authority over Indigenous data back to the inherent stewards of that data, the community knowledge keepers. Next slide, please. So in thinking back to that scale, when we analyzed 20 years of climate research, including 125 field studies that were engaging Indigenous knowledge, we found that nearly nine out of 10 studies practice an extractive research model. So they go in, external researchers go into a native community, document that knowledge, but the people who contribute that knowledge don't necessarily have authority over how that data is gathered, what questions are asked, um, how it's shared out and disseminated. So what I would imagine is that if we duplicated this systematic analysis in other environmental fields, including conservation work, that have this growing interest now in engaging indigenous knowledges, they may also reflect these colonial legacies that we see here. And it raises a few key concerns, one being how these research models erode rather than uphold indigenous rights to self-determination and governance. And the second, addressing one of these primary threats that have been identified as a driver of loss of indigenous knowledges, which is the intergenerational pathways for passing it down from elders and knowledge keepers to youth. Next slide, please. So in this article, we developed 10 questions representing quality research indicators. And these are developed from existing ethical frameworks, such as the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Climate and Traditional Knowledges Work Group Guidelines that are referenced here. And it's really just 10 um, points of reflection that can guide researchers or funders or those of you who review propo proposals to look more critically across all phases of the research. Next slide, please. So these ethical frameworks and reciprocal values center my own work with our indigenous communities, where we recognize how colonial legacies have impacted indigenous conservation stewards and continue to even today, uh, including Luis Vidal Amaro, who's pictured here on a smallholder farm in Sidra, Boriquen, which is our original name for the US territory you might know as Puerto Rico. And this quote from Luis Vidal sums up the relationship between colonial powers and indigenous people here as he reflects on how the colonizers brought seeds, but they also took away, they took more than they brought. Next slide, please. 
And we see that even in initiatives where the North American government seeks to relieve impacts from climate events, for example, indigenous rights and histories are largely ignored as represented in this news article here, which was following recovery efforts from Hurricane Maria. So in this article, rural island families who have lived with and cared for resources on these lands for centuries are described as squatters on their ancestral lands and customary land tenure and stewardship, which is reflected in this quote on the left, are further eroded to accommodate colonial policies that are still in existence. And what I see this as is really the risk of not knowing our histories and continuing to promote those, those myths, those the handful of narratives um, that we seek to decolonize to more effectively and ethically work within these fields of practice. Next slide, please. So as a mother, as a community member, holding responsibility for future generations, this all comes back to the regenerative work that I referenced in the beginning and this question of how do we ensure future generations who are inevitably forced now to face some of the greatest environmental challenges, how will they have access to the diverse ways of knowing that might build their capacity to overcome these challenges and how are we ensuring that they can continue to sustain and engage in indigenous life ways? Next slide, please. So in answering these questions, we developed and field tested a community-based participatory research model centered in indigenous value systems. And I'll just briefly highlight a few of the key methods we applied for strengthening indigenous research governance. And this included participatory community workshops with local community advisory group to co-design those research questions, objectives, and methods holding youth and elder interviews, where youth are the primary researchers and local elders and knowledge keepers, their primary sources of knowledge. And then we bring in climate data models, for example, as secondary data after that. And so this ensures that knowledge goes directly to that next generation, not necessarily to an external researcher or a journal article that the youth might not access. And then also facilitating local and professional science presentations where the youth can share their research stories with their family members, peers, and agency scientists. And we find this really raises the value and attention to, um, the value of and attention to continuing sustaining indigenous knowledges. And then based on the topic and interests that were identified by our community advisory group, in the case of this study, it was observing indigenous cycles of planting and harvesting traditional food crops. We planted an indigenous garden with maize or corn and yuca or cassava, which is an important root crop at a local school that we worked at and worked on finding opportunities to advocate for smallholder farmers whose knowledge is sustained soil and water quality while growing climate resilient, nutritious foods such as yuca. So in other words, this study really helped us to remember our roots in more ways than one. So the last slide now. And on that note, I will just say ha home, thank you for the opportunity to share some of what I learned in this work and to the funders who pay the bills. And if you'd like more information on these studies or our current projects working on indigenous data stewardship and research governance, um, my contact information's here. Or if you wanna follow or join this discussion on decolonizing science, there's the thread and Twitter handle there. So ha home, thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique. That was just a wonderful start and introduction uh, to this discussion. I really cannot thank you enough for being part of it. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our next panelist, but first I wanna remind everyone who's attending the webinar today that we would love to hear your questions. You can go ahead and submit those through the GoToWebinar control panel there on the right, and we will get to as many of the questions as we can, whether they're for, for Dominique or for one of our other uh, panelists. With that, I want to introduce our next panelist. Dina Gillio Whitaker of the Colville Confederated Tribes is a lecturer of American Indian Studies at California State University, San Marcos, and an independent consultant and educator in environmental justice policy planning. Dina's research focuses on indigenous nationalism, self-determination, environmental justice, and education. And at Cal State San Marcos, she teaches courses on environmentalism and American Indians, traditional ecological knowledge, religion and philosophy, native women's activism, American Indians and sports, and decolonization. She also works within the field of critical sports studies, examining the intersections of indigeneity and the sport of surfing. 
Thank you so much, Dina, for joining us today. Hi, peace, Nuxiel, Ku, Isquis, Dina, Julia, Whitaker, and I just uh, greet you in my language that we know as Insokchin. I'm a descendant of the Sinaix band of the Colville Confederated Tribes, and I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Ahashiman people in Orange County in Southern California, which I will talk about a little bit more in a couple of minutes. Um, go ahead and switch the slide, please. I'm the author of two, book, two books. Um, the first one came out in 2016, which was co-authored with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, in which we look at the predominant misconceptions and myths about Native Americans, which deeply informs uh, my work in the next book, which came out in 2019, um, as Long as Grass Grows, which is a deep dive into looking at what environmental justice looks like for indigenous people and in which I postulate an indigenized view of environmental justice uh, based on the argument that the way environmental justice is posed and framed and argued in the country right now is really insufficient. So um, uh, I will talk about that a little bit more. Um, Next slide, please. But first I want to interrogate the, the, the term conservation since we're using that as a foundation for this conversation. You know, what do we mean when we say conservation? I think there's sort of a broad understanding about that. Um, but, I, but in my work, in, in the book that I, uh, my current book about environmental justice, I do uh, deep historical deconstruction of the environmental movement, which we can trace back to the to the era of conservation and preservation, which begins in the 19th century. You know, with the um, the beginning of the national parks system, um, and specifically with the history of Yellowstone National Park. So, um, and, and earlier than that, with um, some of the movements, the social movements that were building up to that. Um, but building on what Dominique was just talking about um, with her definition of wilderness, the concept of conservation is connected to that. And it's really, what we're talking about is a historic, a, a, a social construction of wilderness. So wilderness as this, um, framework that understands <clears throat> uh, empty land, right? Land that Europeans came here um, where they found no people. <clears throat> but as we know, this is a huge myth. This is not true. There were um, millions of people on the land. And, um, and so the, the, the idea of conservation is built and emerges out of this. And so that's why we call this a social construction. Um, but it also is tied to a history of, uh, as Mark Spence, who wrote the important book called um, Dispossessing Wilderness in the late 1990s, you know, really pointed out that, uh, that, you know, the concept of wilderness was not something that was really there, but he says it really had to be created. He says the wilderness first had to be created. And the way that wilderness was created was by basically dispossessing indigenous peoples of their lands because they had been on those lands for thousands of years. And so, um, you know, with the example of the first national parks, we see um, a, you know, which happens in during the period we call the Indian Wars and Native people are systematically run off their lands in order to create these spaces that we now call um, national parks. And also in looking at that history, uh, I trace how the, the trajectory of white settler supremacy and privilege is embedded throughout this, what we call, you know, sometimes the conservation movement is called like proto-environmentalism. Um, and then uh, it, it, it uh, goes into second wave environmental movement of the 1960s and, you know, what we kind of now think of as the environmental movement. So we see this uh, ideology or this, um, these ideas of 
of white settler supremacy really embedded and threaded throughout um, these eras and as always already kind of narrating uh, and forming these conversations of environmentalism as we know it today. Next slide. So um, I'm thinking about my own positionality as someone who's indigenous, I, as a, a person who is native um, to a land that is somewhere other than where I currently live in coastal Southern California. Uh, I'm thinking deeply about what this means. What does it mean to, to be native in someone else's homeland? Like, I don't want to be uh, calling myself indigenous when I'm living in somebody else's homeland like other people. Um, I'm not exactly a settler uh, in the same way that, that people of white settler European ancestry would, would be a settler in the way that we use that term commonly. So, so, so what does this mean to, um, to be indigenous? And my per personal history is that um, I come to reside or I come to be somebody who identifies as somebody who lives in the, what we call the, the indigenous diaspora, which is uh, a result of federal policy of, um, you know, removal and termination. More recently, I come, I was born and raised in Los Angeles in Southern California because of um, the way that federal Indian policy affected my mother's family who were from the Colville Reservation. So uh, this is how I situate myself in the, these conversations. Um, as a researcher and a scholar, uh, my research must be relevant and responsive uh, and responsible to the indigenous community where I live. This is how I approach the work that I do. And um, this is exactly what informs my work that I call indigenizing environmental justice. Um, the photo that you see on the right is, uh, a, is in the, very near the community where I live. I spend a lot of time on this particular beach. And, um, and so this is part of what shapes the way that I think and approach the work that I do as not just a researcher, but also a community member. Okay, uh, next slide. So part of what I do uh, as a researcher and, um, and doing this work that I have come to call unerasing. So um, I do uh, a lot of work in, in a pretty wide variety of communities, which also includes the surfing community, which is a pretty big community in Southern Cal coastal, coastal California in general. And um, I, so I get invited into spaces that um, are not used to talking about uh, indigenous issues. Uh, and coastal Southern California beach space is really, really uh, so much about that. And so I sort of come in and I disrupt the ways that native or that non-native beach people understand their environments. And one of the ways that I've done that is in my work through in surf communities is by um, kind of restoring what Indian country means. Like how do we, and restoring, but also disrupting what we mean by Indian country. Um, and in this case, I created this, this little meme um, to highlight that no matter where you go in Indian country, in, in the United States, it's all Indian country because there was no place on the continent as Dom Dominique's um, map showed earlier, um, there was indigenous people everywhere, and that includes the beach spaces of Southern California. So when we understand um, that no place did not have indigenous people, then we can look at these beach landscapes and understand them also as Indian country, even if they are not currently reservation lands or lands that are uh, that are held collectively by native people. Um, because in, Californ in coastal California, there is actually no coastal land that was reserved for native people through a very, very brutal historical process of dispossession by first the Spanish, 
and then the United States. So, um, so we you know, have to have these conversations, which often makes people uncomfortable uh, in these very white dominated spaces like surf communities. Okay, next slide. So in the work that I do as a teacher, I teach courses on um, environmental issues. I particularly like teaching a class called Traditional Ecological Knowledge, where I can um, bring these issues front and center and talk about what indigenous knowledge means. So uh, TEK, again, it stands for Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And, uh, and the, the, or the school that I teach at at Cal State San Marcos is um, not, it's very close to the coastal area. It's only 12 miles from the ocean and people are very, uh, very kind of ocean oriented. And, um, and so, and it's also happens to be in San Diego County, which most people don't realize uh, has the most Indian reservations of any county in the United States. We have 18, 18 or 19 reservations in San Diego County. And so we have a pretty, pretty robust indigenous uh, community. And so because we have so many native communities, we have access to those communities and we can do um, really deep community-based education. And and so in this course that I teach on TEK, we take the students out on the land in these native communities and we teach them various kinds of aspects of indigenous knowledge, highlighting um, particular aspects of native communities and how native people conceive of land and conceive of uh, ethical relationships to land. And so, so this is what we're trying to do is teach them a, a sense of a land ethic and not a land ethic in sort of the Aldo Leopoldian uh, tradition, which, which really completely erases and ignores indigenous presence on the land. Um, we are restoring indigenous presence on the land and centering indigenous values and indigenous worldviews and what it means to have um, a land ethic. And so my argument is that in order to have a, a, a land ethic that is responsive to not just the environment itself, it has to also be responsive to and accountable to these uh, genocidal histories that have led to this profound erasure of indigenous people. And so uh, one of the ways that I do this with my students is that I, at the beginning of the semester, this is kind of a research project, an ongoing research project I have with the students where I'm gathering data about their attitudes. And so at the beginning of the class uh, semester, I have them write a, a short paper answering the question, what is your relationship to land and place? and indigenous peoples of that place. And so they'll write me a paragraph. And, um, you know, naturally they have never been asked that question before. They don't really know how to respond, but it gets them to thinking about it. And then at the end of the semester, I have them, I ask them that same question again after being immersed for 16 weeks in indigenous worldviews. And, um, and so I wanna see you know, how much, if, if they have changed the way they're, th they're thinking, and if so, how much. And so my, my uh, data so far so, shows that um, of the students that I've surveyed on this, after being immersed in indigenous worldviews and traditional ecological knowledge, only 10% of them say that their views about land and their relationship to land are unchanged. 16% of them say that their views are somewhat changed. And then 71% of them say that their views and their relationship to land and place have significantly changed. And um, I'm kind of gathering some of the, the words that and phrases that they use to describe that. And um, it's just validation that uh, 
and where this is going in my future work is is arguing for an indigenous land ethic that uh, you know when people settler people non-native people are exposed to traditional knowledge it really does create a shift in consciousness um, that we can use to build on for um, things like the work that Dominique is doing in climate change and you know what you know we're working toward social change here social transformation that's ultimately the work I feel I'm engaged in doing with settler populations and um, that kind of sums it up. This is where the work is going for me. And uh, I'm going to stop talking and let Clint go. Thank you so much, Dina. That was wonderful. That, again, just uh, so nicely built on what Dominique shared. And I'm very excited for our discussion. Um, we've already had some great questions come in. Just a reminder, you can submit your questions there in the control panel. With that, I will introduce our final panelist. Dr. Clint Carroll is an Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder. A citizen of the Cherokee Nation, he works closely with Cherokee people in Oklahoma on issues of land conservation and the perpetuation of land-based knowledge and ways of life, and seeks to understand how Cherokee people are negotiating access to land due to complex ownership patterns and the impact of shifting climate conditions. Dr. Clint Carroll, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm excited to have you add to the discussion. Wado, thanks, Dominique. Osio ni gada wo, ukahat si kwanio ha da wado, gali eli ga, ji de da ako he ga. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm really happy to to be here. It's um, kind of an interesting thing with the uh, with our language. Um, to be able to say be here actually kind of means that we're physically somewhere and uh, we're all kind of virtually here today. <laughs> so um, I just kind of an interesting kind of uh, linguistic uh, conundrum for me today. Um, but I, I'm really happy to uh, to be on this uh, webinar. I'm really grateful for my co uh, panelists and um, I hope I can build upon uh, what they've said, what's come before, and and just kind of explain a little bit about my work and how I approach this topic of conservation, um, working with my community and working with um, uh, a new project uh, that is very much a collective endeavor. Uh, and I hope to get into uh, at least uh, touch the tip of the iceberg on that. Um, so I also am here working um, on the land of the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne uh, peoples. Um, I'm just kind of down the road from uh, Dr. David Chavez, um, and so I wanted to to also uh, kind of place myself uh, here in, in in what is now known as Colorado at uh, at CU Boulder. Um, uh, the work that I do uh, is is based in in also, I would say what is now known as Oklahoma, but um, uh, really the, the Cherokee Nation. I work with my uh, community, with my, my tribal nation in northeastern Oklahoma. Um, and so I hope to kind of provide some takeaways uh, in that localized context, uh, as well as uh, to build upon my co-panelists uh, as far as talking about conservation more broadly speaking and what that means for indigenous peoples. Um, and so uh, just to kind of set things up on that broader level, um, I, I wanted to reiterate that you know conservation as a, as a term, um, as a practice, uh, historically, politically, uh, entails so many complexities um, that are rooted in, in colonial and, and, and really Western European contexts, or at least the origins of Western European thought uh, that have informed conservation as we know it in, in the United States. Uh, and so the question you know, that I asked myself uh, before you know, being on this panel and while I was thinking about what I would say is how do we as indigenous peoples practice this? Um, and, and really, in, in reflecting on it, it's, it's, it's about uh, the protection uh, of our lands uh, first and foremost. And so it's kind of um, uh, almost a, um, a, 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 you could say, defensive, but also a matter of recovery in terms of the, the, the approach itself. Uh, but the protection of our lands in the face of encroachment and, and, and degradation uh, that is continual. Uh, it's about enabling uh, the resurgence of our communities. Uh, to kind of draw upon um, other indigenous scholars and their work uh, around indigenous resurgence, uh, like Leanne Simpson, um, Jeff Corntassel, fellow Cherokee scholar. 
uh, but it's also uh, about the maintenance of our um, relationality with land and that's uh, as expressed through our land-based knowledges and practices, uh, land and water based knowledges and practices. So uh, conservation looks very different uh, for our nations, for our communities. Uh, it's very much about being on the land and connecting to it uh, beyond recreation. And so I wanted to emphasize that, you know, we often think about land conservation or just conservation generally as it uh, refers to national parks as, as kind of creating a space for recreation. And again, building upon my co-panelists in terms of what does wilderness mean, what does conservation mean, um, uh, indigenous peoples uh, articulate th those connections to land, uh, less about recreation and more about re uh, connecting to the land in a, um, um, in, in a way that emphasizes our, our long time, uh, excuse me, long term um, uh, uh, knowledge and deep uh, knowledge about the land and, and the practices that go along with that. Um, so although indigenous nations may use uh, dominant legal and political tools or frameworks uh, to accomplish this, and, and if some of you were able to join with uh, Dr. Beth Rose Middleton Manning uh, during our last or the last uh, webinar, um, I think she talked about this um, uh, you know, use of dominant frameworks through land trusts and conservation easements. Um, but still the, the, uh, the intent and the outcome uh, behind indigenous conservation strategies are typically, they typically depart significantly from uh, those of U.S. conservation. Um, I also wrote a, a, relatedly, I wrote a piece uh, that was published in GeoForum uh, titled Native Enclosures, and that really also grapples with um, uh, indigenous conservation as we think about it, and it looks at three cases of uh, tribal national parks uh, and how uh, indigenous nations have articulated that model of conservation, but to very differing um, contexts and, and again, intent and outcome. And uh, it looks at Frog Bay, which is a, a national park, a tribal park uh, uh, managed and operated by the Red Cliff Nation Ojibwe peoples up in uh, Wisconsin, uh, the Ute Mountain Ute uh, National Park, tribal national park in southwestern Colorado, and the Cleoquot um, uh, Tribal National Park in on Vancouver Island. So check that out if uh, if, if you want to email me or go to my uh, um, uh, website and, and download that. Um, I, I post everything that I write on academia.edu. So, uh, but happy to um, connect over email as well. So getting kind of more into my localized work and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to kind of skim through these things. Um, but uh, this is uh, an image of of where I work. Um, uh, very lush, uh, although in comparison to our homelands, uh, and it's worth stating that we are we are a relocated people. Um, the the Cherokee Nation and the majority of of Cherokee people uh, today live in Oklahoma, um, but of course we our homelands are in North Carolina area, the Eastern Tennessee area, Northern Georgia. Um, but nonetheless, we've we've established deep uh, connections and renewed our connections uh, continually to this landscape of uh, rolling hills in the, the westernmost extent of the Ozark uh, Mountains. And so this is just an image of, of the landscape um, broadly kind of um, uh, illuminating uh, where I work and, and um, uh, geographically as well. Um, and so if you could uh, switch to the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, more of a um, detailed uh, image map of our current jurisdictional area, uh, and it highlights uh, the outlines of what we know as the Cherokee Nation. Uh, but within that, it's important to note, especially in this context of my work and how we're approaching conservation um, as, as Cherokees, uh, it's important to note that all of those uh, lands that you see within this, what we call the 14 county area, uh, were at one point under Cherokee ownership, um, collective ownership, so communal lands. Um, and that was about 4.42 or 4.48 uh, million acres. Um, now, as a result of the allotment policy of the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, the darker spots that you see are the, uh, really representing our current tribal trust lands. And, and if you did the math, that comes out to be about 98 uh, percent land loss as a result of, of that policy. And so we look at um, the current state of, of our tribal trust lands today and what we have 
uh, I guess you could say control over, for lack of a better word, um, and it's dismal uh, in comparison to, to the lands that we used to collectively own. And so in that context, um, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, thinking about conservation um, and, and community-based conservation, um, the protection of our lands, and um, how do we establish um, what might be called a Cherokee Nation National Park, uh, if that's uh, the route that we decide to go in, um, because we're operating with significantly less lands than, um, than we once had. Um, so please go to the next slide. Um, so just a little bit of background about who I work with. Um, this is an image of the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers, a uh, group of elders who I uh, have been working with um, for the past 15 some odd years, um, developing uh, relationships, but also collaborations with uh, our elders and knowledge keepers. This is just a few of them who were able to be there to accept uh, a community leadership award back in, uh, I believe, 2017. Um, and so the story of that really uh, came about through my dissertation field work and really trying to understand, as uh, Dr. David Chavez was saying, um, what does it mean as an indigenous person to do, quote, research? And uh, kind of really thinking through that um, along the lines of, of indigenous research methodologies and, and how do we ask the right questions and how do we know uh, the questions that will guide our research uh, are coming from um, our, our, our communities themselves. And so uh, as a product of that work, I've continued to uh, work with the elders and I've just been grateful to and, and really honored to, to be in this uh, collaborative space with them. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, so I, I, I did publish a book on that uh, titled uh, Roots of Our Renewal. Uh, if you want to check it out, all the royalties go to uh, our medicine keepers uh, and the, the work that they continue to do back in Oklahoma. Uh, but more recently, we've um, um, received a, a grant from the National Science Foundation uh, as of 2017. And it's a five-year grant. Uh, we've uh, uh, put our heads together as far as the, the design of the project. Uh, for, for years, they had been wanting to uh, develop a program that connected what they were doing along the lines of, of tribal land conservation and, and uh, knowledge perpetuation uh, uh, with younger generations in some, some kind of structured way. And so as a result of this NSF, uh, what's called the NSF Career Award, uh, we've developed a three-year land education program working with five Cherokee students who they selected. Uh, I designed collaboratively the curriculum with the Medicine Keepers to, to really envision what that three-year program would look like. Um, and uh, we're about a, one and a half years in uh, presently and uh, if you could switch to the next slide. Uh, this was just an image of um, uh, our curriculum development meeting. Uh, it's a bittersweet image because the woman to your right speaking um, just passed away. Uh, her name is Bonnie Kirk and she was just uh, such a um, uh, incredible person and member of the Medicine Keepers and um, uh, we're just all deeply saddened to have lost her recently. Um, but uh, in the middle is Phyllis Edwards, also a part of Medicine Keepers. And um, this was just kind of uh, an image that I wanted to show about what it means to design a land education curriculum um, from a Cherokee point of view. You'll notice that there aren't any, any fluorescent lights. There's a fire in the middle of us. There's um, uh, we're out. We're outside, um, collaborating, talking about what this means and um, and how this is going to differ from a lot of our elders' experience with dominant or mainstream educational systems, um, like boarding schools, for example, that sought to assimilate our our people. And, um, so with that, we uh, we designed a program that was uh, very much intended to push back against that and um, uh, emphasize connection to place, connection to land, and the perpetuation of our, our knowledge and practices, um, but as well um, look at uh, ways that Western science and, and, and botany and uh, even kind of looking at uh, natural resource management policy, environmental policy could uh, create um, a new generation of tribal environmental leaders. And so our program is called the Cherokee Environmental Leadership Program. Um, and we work, uh, you can switch to the next slide. Uh, the Medicine Keepers and I and, and the students work uh, together to um, uh, 
think about and and um, and ask ourselves what does it mean to, um, to to be participating in such a program and this is a picture of our um, place our home you could say uh, it's a newly designated uh, plot of of land that uh, has been um, uh, allocated to our group and the activities, uh, cultural-based activities that we do uh, for for today and going on into future generations as well. So we're really um, happy and, and grateful to have a place uh, to perform these land-based activities that entail connecting to our foods, our medicines, um, uh, you know, both wild and cultivated, um, and then really instilling leadership in in all these areas of our, our traditional knowledge. Um, and so in the interest of time, um, I can't really get into the, the details. You can go to the next slide, um, but I will kind of leave you with um, these images here. This was from our, our kickoff meeting in um, summer 2018. Um, I don't know if you can move that uh, navigation bar, but uh, if you can, Dominique, uh, that will allow us to see the website um, there. If you want to know more, uh, check out our project website and, and blog. I post updates about what we're up to uh, regularly. We have uh, three group meetings per year uh, that really are designed around land-based activities and practices. And, and really the, the goal of this education component is to um, uh, uh, think about what it means to, to connect to the land uh, from a Cherokee perspective. But going forward, uh, the research component of this NSF grant is really about understanding how um, our, our Cherokee people out in the rural areas are navigating uh, landscapes of allotment and climate change affected landscapes in order to get the plants that they need. And then also how our tribal government and um, other experts uh, working with us, uh, including the medicine keepers and the students, can best uh, um, accommodate or, or, or strategize uh, for conserving and protecting um, our tribal lands uh, for those purposes. So thank you very much. Wendell. Thank you so much, Clint. That was a, a wonderful uh, last presentation to get us started. Um, with that, I wanted to move into the moderated discussion. We have just a few minutes here and some great questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. Um, jumping right into your questions, one that I see here that I think is great. What advice would you give graduate students working on uh, conservation, quote unquote, projects to not further perpetuate this extraction method or ignorance of the value of indigenous knowledge and history. Um, any advice, maybe Dominique, let's start with you and then Dina and Clint if you have anything to add. So advice to, to people working in quote unquote conservation to not perpetuate this extraction method. I think there's some really, really good work out there that I would reference that someone could take more time. Like uh, University of Hawaii Manoa just came out with uh, the Kulana Noi guide, for example, and I can share that for the follow-up email as well that's geared toward natural resources programs. But, you know, most of these indigenous ethics and collaborative uh, frameworks and guides and protocols that I draw from in my own work, they really just come back to relational accountability, forming those relationships, which also requires understanding the historical context that one's working within and what communities they're working with, and not just consulting those communities, but really um, having more balanced partnerships and recognizing how we need to shift the power dynamics at every stage of our process. So I can, I can share out a handful of those resources to give folks more time to get into them, but I think it, it will really come back to that. Thank you, Dominique, and we'll definitely send those out. Uh, Dina, anything to add, and then Clint after that? Uh, no, I don't think I can add anything that don't, Dominique didn't already say so eloquently, um, other than just, yeah, to emphasize, to center indigenous communities in your work. Always remember that wherever you work, you are on indigenous land, on native lands, and uh, that have long, long histories of um, native presence, and um, that the knowledge that those people have should be central to the work that you're doing. Wonderful. And Clint, anything else? Um, I would just kind of, uh, well, first ask, because we were talking about this actually when we were getting set up, um, but uh, uh, Dominique, uh, would it be appropriate to share the work that Sarah Cannon is doing around decolonizing conservation, the reading list, and the, the blog post? Uh, 
Yeah, that is a public <laughs> reading list. Okay, Dina's book is on it, among others. And I think, Clint, you should add your book as well, if it's not on there. Um, All right. Yeah. So that's been shared, and Dominique can share that out in the follow-up email. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that's the case, because, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's an amazing resource for specifically addressing that question. Wonderful. Yes, with that, so um, this is from Dominique David Chavez. Uh, she shared a, a reading list. I just put it in the chat panel so everyone has that link, and we will also send it out in the follow-up email within the next few days. That links to a few a additional resources. It, it seems like obviously a lot more than we can go into uh, today with our limited time, but but wonderful question. Thank you for all of that. Um, uh, another question um, from the attendees, and, and Dina, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Um, what role does native languages play in, in connection to places as, as you spoke, and particularly, you know, thinking about local land and, and water resources? Um, can you talk about language a, a little bit and how you've encountered that? Dina, let's start with you, and then Clinton and Dominique, if you have anything to add. Yeah, the I mean, language is important for understanding the frameworks with within which native peoples think about their place and and approach their relationships to those places. Um, and, you know, but unfortunately, language and its retention really varies from place to place. You have places where language is much more um, alive, much more available. Uh, and there are speakers left of the language. Um, in other places, they're not. Like where I'm at, you uh, you don't have. I mean, the language is essentially moribund. I mean, it's not there. It's there's been so much disconnection from it. Um, but that said, you know, there is still, as Viola Cordova said in her book, how it is. Um, even when language is not active, it still creates frameworks for or windows for understanding indigenous worldviews. So, um, you know, I think Clint probably can speak to that more as a speaker of his own language. So, well, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, are you, are you done, Dina? Yeah, yeah. Go okay, ahead. all right, well, I, I thank you so much. I'm, I'm not a fluent speaker, I'm, I'm trying, um, uh, as we say, si de cadet quoi, I'm always uh, still, learning, um, but uh, that is a component, huge component of the project that we're working on, which I um, I had to leave out, uh, not intentionally, but uh, language is, is central to the work that, that we're doing uh, uh, as a group uh, with the students, uh, with our medicine keepers, uh, really trying to emphasize that. Uh, it's a challenge given the setup, the structure. Um, we are, uh, you know, I'm here in Colorado and, and uh, the students are uh, scattered around northeastern Oklahoma and, and, and even central Oklahoma and, and uh, western Arkansas, but we meet virtually every other week to study the language online. Uh, and then they work with their elder medicine keepers individually. Um, uh, and then when we get together as a group, uh, we, we try to center what we're doing and how we would describe it in, in Cherokee. And it's absolutely a fundamental shift uh, epistemically uh, to speak uh, our language because there are, I guess you could say, um, um, you know, connections to English concepts or ways of saying things that more or less translate, but other concepts are an entirely different uh, and it forces us to, to look at the world in a, in a, through a Cherokee lens. Um, and one example can just be the, the names of our plants that we're learning. Um, uh, you know, nouns in our languages are, are I would say, few and far between, uh, like true nouns, uh, because uh, most of our languages are polysynthetic, most of them are verb-based, they describe a world in motion, a living world, and so a lot of our plant names, as we would say, aren't really nouns, they're actually describing um, what the plant does, uh, how it's used, who eats it, whether what kind of animal eats it, these kind of things kind of give insight into the, the knowledge of our ancestors, uh, and, and of course living uh, knowledge keepers as far as how we understand um, uh, the world around us, the, the other than human world. That's such a great perspective uh, from both of you. Dominique, anything else to add? Very. Uh, we would echo the same findings that um, Clint especially described in our own work and what we found with 
um, including and starting with our indigenous and local language and the concepts that are opened up and revealed to us when we do our work that way. Wonderful. Well, um, unfortunately, we that with that we are at time. I know that that hour would went uh, would go so quickly, and it certainly did. Um, but I think that there was just so much I, I want to share with the the three panelists that so many of these questions have just mostly thanked you for all that you shared, your perspectives, your expertise, your knowledge. Um, and I want to echo that as well. I'm sorry that we did not get to go to all the questions, but um, I think that we all got a lot out of the presentations and um, I only wish that we had had more time together, but um, perhaps at a, a future webinar. Um, with that, I just want to say that we will be hosting future webinars. Uh, stay tuned in your email inbox. We will sure, be sure to let you know um, our next webinar will actually focus on urban forestry and innovative approaches to urban forestry. So a little bit of a different topic, but certainly uh, following on on some of these same themes. Um, and I want to thank our panelists. Dina Julia Whitaker, Dr. Clint Carroll, Dr. Dominique David Chavez. Um, I just cannot thank you enough for all that you shared today. This is Dominique Gomez from the Salazar Center at Colorado State University. Thank you all for your time today. And we will send out a recording of the email as well as the many resources that our panelists have shared today within the next few days. Um, Dina, Dominique, Clint, thank you for your time and have a wonderful afternoon. At home. Thank you, everyone. You too. Hello, Dominique. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon.